Coach Mike Bellotti. I'm just here chopping it up with Buck. Hey, thanks for joining us for another episode of Chopping It Up with Buck. Today, I've got a good buddy of mine. Uh, we spent plenty of nights in the studio and days just talking ball. Uh, our past may have crossed one year, I think in 89, my last year at UCLA, you were the Oregon offensive coordinator. So I remember those great Oregon teams with Rich Brooks, and then you took over. Uh, Coach Mike Bellotti, who spent, you know, we were talking about it before the show, you didn't have to move a whole lot. UC Davis, where you where you played, uh, Cal State Hayward, Weber State, and then or Weber State, excuse me, and Chico State, and then Oregon. I mean, you got to spend a lot of time at Oregon from '89 to 2008. Tell us how you pulled that one off. Just pure luck, and, and being in the right place at the right time, having great coaches, great players, a couple of good boosters, and an administration that understood what we needed to do. But you're right. I went from Davis, where I played to Hayward, to Weber, back to Hayward, to Chico. So I made a few moves there. But then once I got to Eugene, I recognized it as a place that I thought I could really love, great place to raise my family. And I thought it was sort of not a hidden gem or anything like that, but I thought it had great potential. And I was lucky. We won, so nobody kicked me down the road. So, <laughs> so, so you, you're being modest, but let, I'll tell people also, I love Eugene, Oregon. Love playing there. Uh, the, the fans are very knowledgeable football fans. They know the game. And I know you dub fans will not agree, but I think Autzen was probably the loudest place. Now, you dub will say they're louder because they've got more, you know, the way they're built. But I can always remember flying into Eugene or flying in wherever we would and going into Eugene and just how beautiful it was. And then you had to get ready for a dogfight. You were the architect of that Oregon kind of renaissance. I mean, you, were, you guys were really good when I played there from 86 to 90. But you were on a rocket ship, and you had some really talented players, and everybody that talks about the O now, they don't quite understand those days. What was it like, you know, being in Eugene, building the facilities, the start of it, and then also working with Nike, which is uh, in Beaverton, Oregon? Probably the best time of my life. And, again, when you're on an upward trajectory as a team, as a program, it just feels great, and you can't wait to start the next year. We did it by combination of marketing better, changing the brand recognition across the nation, Nike, Phil Knight, Todd Van Horn, Tinker Hatfield, they helped us with that part of it. But then we still had to find young men that would get into the uniforms and not think the uniform was going to win the game. If they had to win the game and, and to make sure that they were there for the right reasons. But I thought we recruited great players. I had great coaches and it was tough sometimes. I have a a lot of turnover on, on my staff early on because we didn't pay a lot of money and, and it wasn't the kind of job that people thought was a destination. But now it's become that, even though they've had a few coaches in the last few years. But the reality was Rich Brooks was there for 18 years. I was there for 14 years as the head coach. And it got to be a place that you loved, that you believed in, and that you could sell. Yeah. It wasn't a rival for us, but I love playing those Oregon teams back in the day. Y'all had some really talented players. A lot of those L.A. guys would end up going there. Now, from my home state, a lot of Texas kids that you were just, you know, just coming up there, like Michael James. I, I, I can't remember all of them, but once you guys started the Texas pipeline, that was like what it was at UCLA. You know, one of the things I want to ask you about is all the social unrest and, and everything that's going on. There's social issues that are happening, and some coaches – aren't handling it well. Mario Cristobal was one of the first guys to, to speak out, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, and then there's some others that have had some real impassionate uh, pleas for justice and helping kids out. But there are a couple of guys, uh, and I'll say, you know, Mike Gundy was one, Kirk Ferentz, Tom Herman. They've struggled a little bit with this because their players are saying, hey, we want this we don't quite see it. I'm not picking on just those three, but you and I had that conversation about it. How would you have approached something like this during your time at Oregon? Well, first of all, you know, no player cares how much you know until he knows how much you care. And it doesn't matter about the color of your skin. It's, do I love this young man? And I tell our players when they came in, 
you're going to learn to love your teammate. And, I, and they'd say, look at me like funny, like, what do you mean love? I, I mean love like a brother. You're going you're gonna to fight and scrap and all that, but at the end of the day, you got his back and he's got yours. And the reality is you've got to communicate and you have to create opportunities for each of your players to get to know each other and for you as a coach and every coach to get to know the players. We used to do things called unity meetings, which we stole from Florida State which was a leadership model. And we'd break the team down into groups of six and we'd have five or six prepared questions that they would talk about. And then every year we would every, we did it three times a year. We would mix up the groups and we have a black guy with a white guy, with a Samoan, with a Hispanic, with a freshman, with a senior. And so they all had to listen to each other talk and they all had to discuss their answer to the question. They hear everybody else's answer. And it could be, like, when was the first time in your life you noticed a difference? And some people took that as a racial question. Some people took it as a socioeconomic question. But it got them understanding where everybody came from and that everybody, regardless of who they were, how old they were, how much of a star player they were, had similar issues they had to deal with in their life. And I think the difficulty now with the COVID situation, it exacerbates this thing because – Kids can't come together. And you can only get groups of four or five or whatever. And that's hard because they've got to become a family. They've got to trust each other. And they've got to see that the coaches are willing to trust them. And we had a we had a deal. And I'm, Buck, I'm going long on this answer. No, no, no. I, 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 yeah, please take your time. I tell you, after we lost a bowl game to BYU, and I don't even know, I think it was 2006 maybe. And it was, I hated it. I didn't feel comfortable about it. I didn't like the way we played in the game. I didn't like the way we handled the loss. I didn't like the way we went through winter court in the, in the off-season condition. And I told the player, and so I, I didn't kidnap the players, but I created, we had a meeting, we had an intervention kind of deal. Mm-hmm. I took the entire team by bus off campus, out of town. We sat down, all the coaches and every player on the team, and we wrote up on a wall what we liked about the team and what we didn't like about the team and it, and it could be anything and everybody got a chance to speak and they could say that they didn't like me. They didn't trust me. They didn't whatever. But I said, okay, these are all the things that we feel are a problem. These are the things we like. Okay. Give me some solution pages. How can we create an opportunity for us all to feel better about ourselves, that we communicate, that we trust each other, that I know you and you know me, etc. And, So we had all these things and we burned all the bad things and we took all the good things and put them up on our walls in our locker room. And we lived by that. And one of the kids was testing me. And this, we went on from 7 7 p.m. at night till about two in the morning. We got them back, dropped them off on campus. And I had, I had taken notes and I had also, everybody gave me their original sheet of paper because we asked them like 10 questions. And I read every single one. It was 123 or 150. I don't even know how many. And one player said, Coach, I don't believe you care about this. I don't think you're going to read it. If you really read this, come up to me tomorrow in the weight room, tap me on the shoulder. And I said, okay, easy money. So I went the next day, tapped him on the shoulder. He looked at me like, oh, my gosh, he really does care. He read all that stuff. Even though like, I didn't get home till 2 in the morning, I probably stayed up till 4 reading it because it was very important. to me. If my players – didn't trust me or didn't trust some of my coaching staff or didn't like or believe in what we were doing, I want to change it. I want to give them a voice. Now, at some point, I would tell them too, hey, guys, we all have opinions, and I'll try to go with the majority, but I also have a feeling about where we need to go as a team and what I believe in and what I represent. And so I gave them a voice. I listened to that voice, and then we tried to find a happy medium that we could all rally behind. Yeah. And that's interesting. People just want to be heard a lot of times. And, you know, looking at what we were talking about, you were the offensive coordinator around the time of the Rodney King incident. Did any of your L.A. guys come and have conversations with you or anybody on the staff about that time? Because that was a, a tumultuous time as well, for especially for those guys that may have been at home having to come back and work out and do those different things. It was. And, and I can tell you, Buck, everywhere I've been, whether I was at Chico or Hayward or Oregon or wherever, and we would have kids who would go home for breaks and they would come back and talk about some of their family or some of the best friends got killed in a drive-by shooting or something like that or whatever. And we would talk about it and we would try to figure out, you know, there's nothing we can change about that, but we can empathize. And I'd tell them, guys, 
I, I never lived in that environment. And I, I give you credit for trying to, not trying to, for getting out of it via using sports. You know, you and I, I think, believe sports athletics are a meritocracy. You get to play because you are the best at what you do. And color's not, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the color of your skin, but it doesn't matter how hard you play, how much, you, how committed you are, how much you believe in yourself and your teammates. And I, I always felt like we always had the need to listen because we were the surrogate parents for every single kid. And I would tell kids sometimes, you know, I, I'm going to share one other story. I, so I'm <laughs> teaching at Cal State. I went to an all-white high school, Ignacio yeah. Valley High School in Concord. I went to UC Davis when I think we had four black kids on the team. Uh, so I was never in that environment. I go to, I go to work at Cal State. Hey, we're my first coaching job there after I leave Davis, after I leave the womb. And the very first day I'm going to Oakland Tech to, <laughs> to recruit. And the coach says, Coach, can you bring your projector because ours got broken down? So I said, yeah. sure, no yeah. problem. So I walk up the hill, park downstairs, down in the parking lot, walk up, the, and class lets out. And class lets out. Every single person is black. Every single student, every single teacher, every single, and I'm going, wow, wow, I feel weird. I, I'm, the, I'm the minority here. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know anybody, and I feel like, oh, gosh. But then all of a sudden, one of the female PE teachers who I had had in my classes says, hey, coach, how are you doing? Coach Pilati. And I wait there, I look at him. And as soon as you know somebody, as soon as you feel like you're accepted or you, you have a friend, it all changes. You feel very comfortable. But until that time, and I've, I've shared this with black families when I go into their homes, I said, I don't know what it's like to be black. I'm, I'm Italian, I'm, but I'm white because that's the only category I can check now. But the reality is I'm saying I understood. I felt at that moment like they would feel walking into a building with all white people where you're the minority. And it's, it's weird. It's a feeling that, I didn't like because it, it, I was somewhat fearful, just uncomfortable. But as soon as somebody says, hey, hey, you, you know, a patch on the back, then you're okay. And I, I always felt like sports was the great arbitrator, equalizer, icebreaker. You know, hey, well, let's talk ball. So <laughs> yeah, That's always the case. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I ask you about it from a coach's perspective, but you had an incident as an AD with LeGarrette Blunt, and I think it was Chip's first game. You know, he's, he's taken over for you. He was your offensive coordinator, then he becomes the head coach. And I think it was against Boise State, LeGarrette Blunt, uh, who had a nice pro career and a guy that, you know, volatility sometimes yeah. plagued him at other times, but he was a competitor. I always loved that about him. He, he punched the guy, and it, it was just a big melee. How did you and Chip work through that? Because you were the athletic director at that time at, at Oregon with that incident. That wasn't an easy one <laughs> to get off. No, no. It, I tell you what. It, okay, I'm the new AD. I've got the new president of the university in my box and the new conference commissioner in my box. It's the first <laughs> game of the season, and we're getting our butts with it. I mean, it's not a good game. We get uh, beaten by Boise at their place. LeGarrette's held to probably 25 yards. He was frustrated. They're walking off the field, and unfortunately, one of their players calls him a name, and a, not a nice name, and a derogatory comment. Mm -hmm. And you can actually see it in the film. Chris Peterson. Yeah, I remember watching film. You could see him actually yeah. do that. That's right. Chris was going to grab his guy to tell him no, and LeGarrett just turns and levels him. And LeGarrett did not – I mean, he was beyond. He was so mad. Scott Frost had to actually carry him off the field. Thank God for Scott Frost being on the staff at that time. I had hired him. But so Chip and I talked. And, I, and obviously I said, hey, I think you need to suspend him. Chip says, no, coach, I got I to gotta get rid of him. I said, no, no, you don't. Well, our job is, ed, as, is as educators, we have to help people overcome these type of things. He goes, coach, I can't do it. I just, I said, I'll support you. You're my head football coach. I, I also didn't want to step on his toes because I had been the head football coach. Mm -hmm. I'm the AD now. I said, I'll support you, whatever you want to do. But my recommendation is suspend him indefinitely, work out a plan for him to be able to come back through behavior improvement, certain checkpoints that he had to make, and then, uh, you know, decide whether he ever plays again or not. He said, no, I'm kicking him off. I said, okay. So, well, then Tony Dungy talked to him at some point about four to six weeks later and basically said the same thing I said. Yeah, he yeah. said, you know what? Give him a way to get back. Give him a way to salvage what he what has happened. So it's Tony not what Stone was that on your team uh, on the team at the time. I think, yeah, he was either yeah. being recruited or he yeah, was on so. the team as a true freshman. 
Yeah. And so Chip said, yeah, maybe Mike was right. And so he did reinstate him. He didn't play till the very last game of the season, played against Oregon State in the Civil War, went on to have a very good pro career. You know, for, for me as a junior, he rushed for – he and Jeremiah Johnson both rushed for 1,000 yards on the same backfield. So he was a talented guy. Yeah. And really, I had never – I'd never seen that side of him. I'd never seen that problem. Uh, but obviously in that situation, the, the wrong word was the incendiary device that yeah. sent him off. Well, and that's the thing. I think he got mislabeled for that. I know there were some other things where, you know, he, he, he would admit, and I think I've even heard him talk about, hey, I could lose my cool. But that's just, you know, sometimes you have guys that compete so hard, they don't yep. know when to turn it off. And I thought in that situation, I was like, I don't – I would have done what he did. <laughs> yeah, know? no, and, and there, I, I, there's one other incident in practice where I had to separate he and Jarris Bird. And they're both great players and played yeah. in the NFL for a long time. But they are very competitive. And, and you want that kind of competition. But also, you, you have to understand, they have to understand that there's a point at which you step back and say, okay, uh, we're done. And when you walk out inside the white lines versus outside the white lines. <laughs> hey, one, one thing, too. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. This is Chopping It Up with Buck, Coach Mike Bellotti. We'll be right back. Hi guys, Didi Wong here, and as you guys may know, I am an international award-winning speaker, I'm an entrepreneur, and I love investing in amazing products out there, one of which is now Thin Energy. It is a plant-based beverage, it has really huge hydration benefits. My favorite is the Peach Passion. I am so excited about this project, it's called Thin Energy, please check it out. All right, welcome back to Chopping It Up with Buck. We had some great Oregon stories, but but Coach, I want to ask you this. With COVID uh, and, and all the things now, I, I, each day you have to kind of keep up with it. I know I do. There's new testing protocol that are minimum testing protocols. Uh, what about the staff? You know, you and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Not only the coaching staff, but the, the staff around the players, uh, trainers, the medical staff, because there's so many things, as you well know, being the head coach and the AD, the, the reports you have to get, okay, who's available? If, if the CDC says we're, they have two negative tests, we can bring them back a little early, potentially. You know, there's so many different things. How would you handle that if you were in those seats of these college football coaches and administrators? First and foremost, I'm glad I'm not. Because <laughs> I'll tell you, I mean, I don't think there's anything more difficult than what they're going to go through if there is a football season this year. I don't know if you saw that the NFL, I believe, they said if somebody tests positive, they'll put them on IR for three weeks. Well, yeah. for them, that's easy because then they'll just sign somebody else, bring them in. But in the college situation, you don't have that opportunity. We have a group of 120, 110, whatever it is, bodies ready to go. And then all of a sudden, if, if five of them test positive and they're quarantined for three weeks or two weeks or four, whatever it is, and they play the same position, what happens if all your quarterbacks get wiped out? You go to the next game without any quarterbacks. I just think it's very difficult. And as you said earlier, this is real key. You know, who are the oldest people associated with your program? Typically, it's the doctors, the trainers, the people that have been there a long time. But they're also the people that we're most worried about getting COVID-19 because the results could be disastrous for them or you're taking it home to your family. Most of us are assume that young kids won't be as affected by it. However, there's more studies showing now that there can be some long-term damage to the lungs, you know, some other things. And as you know, as soon as a, an active college football player goes down, and I say, when I say go down, unfortunately, you obviously don't want nobody to pass on or have some permanent damage that doesn't allow them to play football again. But as soon as that happens, it's going to be shut down for sure. And it doesn't matter if it happens first game, fifth game, ninth game. You know, we've looked at – they've shortened the season. They're not going to play non-league games now. They're going to maybe – I saw where Oregon is going to play Utah now in place of Ohio State because they're going to pick up one more league game. Yeah. And I, did, I just saw that today. I saw the MEAC conference is going to push it back to the spring. I'm just afraid – I was very confident about two months ago we're going to have football. Some yeah. way before we're going to have football. A month ago, I started to get a little bit worried because all the athletic directors and all the spike and all these things. If you look at Arizona and Florida and Alabama and Louisiana, 
Uh, I think there's seven states that they say are going to shut down. I mean, shut down again completely. Yeah. And it's Alabama, Louisiana, Florida, Texas, uh, Arizona, and I'm not sure where the other. But they're all football states. Two of them contain Pac-10 teams, and the others were SEC teams and Big Big 12. It, it's just it's something until we get an antidote, until we get a vaccine, yeah. I think we're all just guessing. We're all just hoping. They're pushing things back to hope that something occurs that makes it less uh, invasive to the, the general population and to specifically, uh, you know, the athletes. Nobody, parents of athletes don't want to put them at risk. Athletes don't want to be at risk, even though we all think we're superhuman when we're that age. You know, that's, that's not to get us. Yeah. But it's the other... Uh, people that are related to the program that are in touch with uh, the players that can be affected. You know, you bring up a good point. I think the, the other piece of this is if it does happen, if it starts, you win the first game, uh, kids, you're going to tell the kids, hey, they can't go to a party or you can't leave your respective bubble of wherever you are. You know, any any college USA? Well, you're absolutely right. And I didn't think about that. I haven't even got that far about it. But what do you tell your kids as a coach about yeah, – I always told them, hey, you got tonight to celebrate. You go enjoy this victory, but tomorrow we start planning for the next game. Well, I'm not sure you can do that now. You're right, because the amount of people they'll be exposed to and then they'll bring back and expose the rest of the team, yeah, it's it's scary. And I, I think most of the Pac-12 schools have said, we're not going to have football if the students can't be on campus. Well, I still haven't read where – all of them have said, we're going to allow our students back. I thought some of them were still going to go through online classes. So it's, I think nobody really knows. I think they're, we're all hoping that a football season occurs. The athletic directors and college presidents have to have college football to pay the bills and to keep the image of the university out there. And it may, the safest thing may be to push it back to the spring. I don't know how that would work. It's, it's weird. I saw somebody said, you know, it just, to me, I think it was uh, the coach at Oregon State, Jonathan Smith, said, fall, fall is football time. I just can't imagine you know, no. playing in the spring. And I understand that, but these are unique times. Yeah. Hey, one, one question for you, too. You know, we're, we know Rick Neuheisel real well, and he's been on this for a while, and I have, too, having uh, coached with him at the AAF and, you know, had fun doing that. But a, a commissioner for at least the Power Five, group of college football. I mean, I think it's long overdue and something like this is really showing that you have to have kind of one voice, even if people don't like what that one voice is saying. It seems like for college football and those power five conferences, at least you need somebody that can be the voice of uh, almost the one that can say, these are the things we have to do for all these conferences. Cause there's so many different variables for all of them. I, I agree 100%. And I think that there's several that you talk about scheduling. If yeah. one person overseeing said, hey, we're going to equalize scheduling. You talk about this type of pandemic where now the, the hard part for this is that each state actually controls what happens on their campus. The, the health deal from each state, the governor basically passes on down. And both the county and city can have more restrictive rules if they see fit than even the state itself. So even though if you had a commissioner, which I think is a great idea and much needed, simply to equalize, standardize, make it a, a more level playing field, we are going to say it's not ever going to be a level playing field, but still that would help it. But I think uh, a commissioner is, is much needed, and I agree with you. By the way, Rick is over in Oregon playing in the Pronghorn Invitational. Right now. <laughs> I know. Uh, I think he was playing golf somewhere. And I yeah, knew he was he is, he is. I was going to say – He's right ten down miles, the ten miles from you right now. <laughs> now, if he doesn't want the job, would you consider it? Because I think you know your your background would would lend itself well for that. Uh, being at all levels of college football, really understanding, you need somebody that understands it and is not just an administrator, which you've been, but also a coach for a long time with a program like Oregon or a, a program that you had to build from scratch. Would you be interested in something like that? Probably not, <laughs> but, but <laughs> I, I, I appreciate you even mentioning that. And you know what? Uh, there's a part of me certainly that would love to do something like that because you're right. I mean, I coach the Division two football, Division one, yeah. AA, Division one. I've been an athletic director. I've worn a lot of hats. Uh, I mean, I was in the 
Board of Trustees for the American Football Coaches Association, and I recognize it from a lot of angles of what needs to be done. But it's also, I'm 70. I'll be 70 this year, and I'm going, now, is that something I could do? Yeah, but I enjoy golf, pickleball, and fishing too. And, you know, if they, they might make you work too hard. Well, Coach, I need the water you're drinking at, at 70. I mean, you know, you're, you're keeping yourself good. We play golf whenever you used to come here, and uh, you'd yeah. stay out on the course. We could, we probably could have played 36 holes if we had daylight. I know how much you like it. Well, that you know, is one, true. I would. <laughs> one other thing about you just mentioned the, the, the Big Ten and the Pac-12 going to conference only. I think the SEC and ACC and Big 12 and also Notre Dame are in some kind – they're not in collusion – but it seems like they kind of worked this thing to say, let's wait a minute and let's see, because they're pushing it back to the end of July to kind of figure out what they want to do with their – and I, I think Greg Sankey has been a real solid voice, very thoughtful. He's done a really nice job, in my opinion, and the, and the uh, Big Ten Conference Commissioner also making a decision early. Uh, but, but what are your thoughts on, on how they decided to kind of just let's, – let's hold it back a little bit, Swafford and um, Sankey and, and the Big 12 Commissioner? I think they're taking a cautious approach. I think they're being a little bit uh, uh, not overconfident is not the right word. I think they're hoping that time buys them a full football season with fans in the stands for every game and a full 12 game schedule if they can get it. Uh, the, the reality is I'm, I'm less sure it's even going to happen. And I think every athletic director and every conference commissioner now is looking at, okay, what's the next alternative? Because we talked about pushing things back, once again, to allow the spiking to, to disseminate, to hopefully find a vaccine. That's probably not going to happen during this calendar year. Uh, I think now the next thing is people are looking at the social distancing part if they do have a season and how you can only fit 20 to 30% into your stadium. And that gives everybody the correct social distancing and the wear mask and the whole thing. And some people, that still may not fly. It may not be allowed by state laws or state mandates from a health standpoint. Um, going to the spring to me is going to be as difficult as it will be for all of us because I don't know what I'm going to do from basically Thursday through Monday night and, <laughs> and all day Saturday watching, you know, Sunday watching games. I mean, I'm going to go nuts. First time in my life, and we're talking 70 years, that there's not going to be football. And that's, that's a hard thing to say and a hard thing to talk about. But I think the reality is uh, the, the ones that have already said league only, I think they decided to get ahead of the cart, mm -hmm. so to speak. Those that are still waiting are hopeful that something still may develop that can help, that can offset the virus, that can be a vaccine. But everything I read, and as you know, we each read so much every day just on this football subject because everybody chimes in. And then you're looking at what all the health officials are saying. I'm going, wow, I don't know who to trust. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. I was telling somebody, I think also, too, I think those folks, the commissioners and the ADs and the presidents, if they're smart, they take the approach of our universities are teaching institutions and they have some really well-renowned researchers across the country. Not just in the you know Oregon or UCLA, but Michigan, you know, all across the country. Any medical facility has some really strong minds and research. So maybe the noise is doing one thing, but I think those guys have really honed in on who they need to trust and who can kind of give them some insight into what is really unknown for all of us. Well, and speaking of that, I talked to Rob Mullins a couple of weeks ago because I was doing a sort of a little report for a group of people and basically he says that the Pac-12 they have a a health group that is br been brought together from UCLA and all these other places uh Oregon Med Center the entire thing and that they uh are getting the best expert advice and coordinating and sharing advice yeah. across the board yeah they're, they're, they're getting rid of the noise basically and then also too as you well know on these campuses where there's research done, they're looking ahead at things we haven't even thought to be thinking of. And so that's what I think if you're smart, which I know most of those folks are, they're really, they got some kind of consortium of people that they can rely on and say, this is our voice. This is science that we need to listen to to help protect our folks. Absolutely. And these are scientists 
that are at the cutting edge of their business. And they also are thinking about not just the student athlete, but everybody involved with the universities and what's the best situation for them. Yeah, well, Coach, I appreciate you coming on. We do a thing here uh, at the end of the show called the two-minute warning. We just we march down the field. We make it easy for you to score. So being a former offensive coordinator, I know you're going to be on the attack. So I hope. <laughs> the first one, what's the handicap right now? The handicap right now is about 11. Oh, man. Brooks. Way better than mine. So I, I need, I need you, I'll use yours when I go out and play. You, you move the ball down the field a little bit. What's, what was your favorite play on third and maybe six or seven? What, what, would, what was your go-to in that, in that range? You know, I, I tell you what, I always thought that was the tough. I would spend more time on third and six to seven than any other down there was because typically the, the other team would get into – bump or something or yeah. corner roll because they didn't want to give you the little quick out, which would be the easy. Actually, it was option routes by the inside, by the tight end, typically. That was my favorite route in that situation. Put them somehow where I could put two tight ends in the game and give them a double option. Oh, like yeah. That. that was, yeah, that was mine. Balance the defense. That's why I asked because I, I know how difficult it is and talking to every offensive coordinator I've ever played for third and five, four, five, six, I need you. Okay, I, that's, that's a first down for me. So we moved down the floor. I, I caught a big one for you, yeah. <laughs> hey, w when you think about uh, some of the, the great players from your Oregon time, who were a couple of guys that, that just stood out for you on the offensive side that you just you marvel at some of the things they were able to do, not just from the practice field, but on the game field? Uh, well, you know, Keely Smith was an amazing athlete, and he could take a game in hand. Because he'd throw the ball well, but he could move, and he was physical in the pocket. He could push away. He could straight arm a pass rusher, and they had no chance. And like, then he could sidestep and find the guy down the field and throw the ball accurately with pace. And he – I remember a game we played at Washington. He made some of the most unbelievable plays, and there'd be a breakdown of the protection – He'd make the guy miss, scramble, make yardage, or he'd just physically straight on the guy and say, hey, that's it. You know, the other guy, I, I, gosh, there's so many, but maybe a guy like uh, Maurice Morris, who oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, put the play against Colorado in the Fiesta Bowl where he rolled off of the would-be tackler and went for a <laughs> touchdown. You know, he's another guy. He had he and Ontario Smith both were thousand-yard rushers in the same backfield one year, so – those guys were pretty amazing. I always thought that Keely Smith may have been a little bit ahead of his time because the offense is now the way the pros are a little bit more suited for his skill set and maybe going to a place that would have allowed him to just kind of develop into that quarterback that we see now in the NFL. Yeah. Oh, no, no. He, he was that. In fact, well, so was Dennis Dixon. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I had a great quarterback. I'm a, I leave out Joey Harrington and all those other guys. But the reality is – Dennis Dixon, had he stayed healthy, I believe would have been the front runner for the Heisman Trophy. We would have been in the national championship game. He was just so perfect for our offense at that time and a lot of stuff that they are doing right now. I mean, uh, with the zone read and turning people loose. Uh, and he had, he had agility, he had ability to make people miss. He just he got caught one too many times. Yeah, that's true. So, Coach, what was your record in the Civil War versus Oregon State? Uh, uh, maybe like eight and six or so. I don't, okay. all I know is I won more than I lost. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, you were in the red zone. You score. Hey, thanks for coming on. We'll have to have you on again. This was fun. I, I really want to get, get to talk to you more about your growing up in Sacramento. And, but we had so much stuff that was COVID related. I thought it was just, this would be cool to, to hear from an administrator and some of the things that you had to do. And actually, I, I hear so many people talk about what they would do. You had to actually live that. So it was great to have you on. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, thanks for joining us on this episode of Chopping It Up with Buck, my friend Mike Bilotti, Coach Bilotti. You have a good one.